Thank you, Adam. Hello and welcome. I'm Beverly Adams, Curator of Latin American Art here, and I wanted to add a, a few more things to Pablo Suvi. He's, his work is also in the Bland collection. I'm thrilled to have these three artists with us today so that we can uh, discuss their works uh, that are in the exhibition, but also I've asked them all to think about sort of the context of being a photographer and an artist in Lima in the various periods that are represented by the exhibition, and all of them have very interesting stories and um, perspectives on that. Um, I first wanted to start a little bit about the genesis of the show, where it came from and how it developed, because I think it's interesting and kind of a lucky story that we're able to have this exhibition here. Um, it really began with me doing studio visits in Lima. I went to go see Pablo and other photographers that are in the show, and I saw Luz Maria's retrospective, and I became interested in the strength and continuity of Peruvian photography. Um, at least in the contemporary period, so I started to dig a little bit further into the history, and I was sort of thrilled to discover that this is arguably, Peruvian photography is arguably the strongest sort of continuous tradition um, in Peruvian art. Maybe you could even put it on the same par as literature um, in the 20th century for Peruvian art, um, and that the further I dug back in time, the more interesting and more context I got for the, the contemporary um, production and so the exhibition is really kind of a line from 1968 to the present, really focusing on specific, um, specific things that happened in the 70s and 80s and how they impacted the next generations. And the lucky part of the story is I was researching something else late at night. You know, I thought, well, how am I going to do an exhibition like this? And I even went to the boss, Simone, which is the director of the plant, and I said, you know, I think we should do a contemporary Peruvian photography project, maybe a collection, maybe an exhibition and talk the Harry Ransom in Center into like maybe looking into historical photography and buying something. And maybe we can do something together, collaborate. She's like, well, why can't we do it all? Because that's how Simone is. She's very, <laughs> very optimistic. But late one night when I was researching um, indigenism in South America and in Mexico, I typed the magic word Peru into the Henry Ransom Center's website, and I discovered that there was 140 photographs in the Harry Ransom Center. Um, of photographs taken in the 1970s and 1980s that were purchased and donated to the Harry Ransom Center um, by uh, photographer and philanthropist Bill Wright. And the reason that those photographs are there is because of Fernando Castro. He created an exhibition in 1989 called The Peruvians, which traveled throughout Texas, went to PhotoFest, also went to Washington, D.C. and other states in the country. And that entire cache of photographs was selected by Fernando and then has since sort of been dormant laying in the HRC since 1990. So it was, a, it was a thrill to be able to go in there, dig through, and make the connections. And with a perspective of 25 years since, since the project, to see how clearly Fernando at the time had really identified what the strengths and important issues in photography were in those two decades, and then how, how salient and important they still were for the, 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 the generations working now. So, that is kind of the background of, uh, of the story, and it was a great um, opportunity then for the Blanton to collaborate with the HRC. Um, tonight we're going to discuss, as I mentioned, specific works by the artists as well as the context of their making of art in the, in the 1970s till today. So I just wanted to start with Fernando, if that's all right. Um, uh, we feature your photographs in Fixing Shadows, um, and one in particular, but it was really a photograph that was made as part of a larger project called Five Rolls of Plus X that you executed in the late 1970s, like 1977, is that correct? And then it was exhibited in the Sequencia Photo Galleria in, in Lima. And I was hoping that you would sort of describe the project and how it fit into the context of photography in Lima at the time, um, especially the disconnect you described to me between photography and literature since this project was actually a book that included both. Okay, well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to, to be here. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, and thank you for uh, discovering that uh, we are interesting. <laughs> I, I, I have my doubts myself. No. But, um, uh, okay, um, I was not part of the uh, Sequencia group strictly speaking, but I became part of it because of uh, 
an invitation by Fernando La Rosa. And uh, he saw an exhibition that I had uh, previous to the one in Sequencia um, uh, that were basically graffiti. And at that time, I was too young to know the work of Aaron Siskin. But Aaron Siskin actually came to, uh, to Sequencia. And uh, when he saw my photographs, he, he told me, uh, you know, you need to loosen up. <laughs> and, uh, but then he asked me, where do you take them? <laughs> so anyway, some of the photographs that he took in, in, in Peru were taken in the same place where I took mine. And then I came to this other set of uh, photographs, uh, which was a project that I started in the mid-70s. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, my idea was to, uh, to do a kind of a remake of a famous book of uh, Peruvian poetry that was published in 1927 by the uh, poet Carlos Oquendo de Amat. And uh, that uh, book of poetry had been rediscovered in the late 60s. And so I came upon it and I was fascinated by it. It was called Five Meters of uh, Poetry, that one. And, uh, and so I did the variant, uh, Five Rolls of Plus Six, because uh, Plus Six was the kind of film that actually Fernando La Rosa recommended us to use. So uh, I went around uh, the streets of Lima uh, and uh, photographed life in, uh, in the streets of Lima. And so both the poetry and the photographs had that sense of uh, organization that people gave to their lives on the streets, and, uh, but also of a little chaos. And, uh, and so when Fernando saw them, and uh, you know, I reluctantly showed him uh, my poems that went with the, with the photographs, I, I was very shy, so I said, um, you know, he liked the, the, the photographs, but I said, you know, they, they kind of also go with the poems. And at that time, mixing text with, uh, with image was a little bit forgotten. So, but Fernando kind of understood the connection, and so he said, well, we'll just publish them in, the, uh, in uh, Sequencia Textos. So I don't know what it's showing now, but that is actually what resulted uh, later on when it was put into book form. And actually, just like that exhibition in 89, uh, was born here in Texas, so was this book, because it was published by a small publisher called Studia Hispanica, by a Peruvian writer called Luis Ramos Garcia. So that exhibition that I had in 1977, I believe, uh, became a book in, in 1983. Do you think that uh, Fernando, Cast Fernando La Rosa's not wanting to have text and image together, was that because he didn't want it the text to be illustrated by the photographs? Was he trying to get away from that kind of association or was it just keeping the media separate? We know that by founding Sequencia, he was putting a mark in the sand and saying, photography is an art artistic tradition and different from photojournalism and different from illustration. Do you think it was part of that issue well, or was it something different? I think it came, uh, Mind you, Fernando was very receptive about in including the text, so I was thankful you know, for, for that. But during that time, there was a belief that images speak by themselves. And I, I have always found that to be rather curious because really they don't. They, images only when they are something familiar to us or semi-familiar or decipherable uh, they speak uh, by themselves, but if you know, if you should go, for example, to uh, some exotic place like Thailand, and you saw a, a painting two thousand years old, and you don't know who the characters are, well, they don't they don't speak to you and say, well, I'm so and so. If you go to the Vatican and uh, look at uh, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, you know because you already have knowledge. You know that is you know God the Father, and that is you know Adam, and that is you know because you know that's in your, in the, you're familiar with that. So images really, you know, need some additional information. 
But my poems were not about the images, nor the images about the poems. What happened was that there were things that I could show, and there were things that I could tell. And, and what I could say and what I could tell were two different things. If you don't mind, I'd like to shift to um, the exhibition that you curated in, in 1989. You've called yourself a accidental curator. Um, and it would be great if you could tell us a little bit about the context for photography in Lima at the time that you did this exhibition and how you made your selection um, and sort of the, the issue between photo documentary and artistic Okay. Lots of questions there. I know, sorry. Um, I piled them all at once. Well, I'll okay, okay. The accidental part. The accidental <laughs> part was that I, I really didn't come to Lima in 1987. I didn't return to Lima because I was studying at Rice. I was studying philosophy. So basically, I went to Lima thinking, okay, I'm going to teach philosophy. And because I, I was an artist, I'm going to do art. You know, as I do philosophy, I'm going to do art, and I'm going to write all the novels that I wanted to write and write all the poetry that I wanted to write. But then my friend Roberto Fantosi, who is also in this exhibition, uh, called me up one day and said, look, at ICNA, they have this uh, exhibition of uh, Western and the Monterey Circle. So let's go see it. So you know, we were touring the exhibition. And in walks Elvira de Galvez, who was the director of uh, the cultural page of El Comercio. And so Roberto says, oh, this is my friend Fernando, who is a writer and a photographer. And so the two things mesh together. And she said, well, why don't you write about this exhibition? And I said, okay, and, and I never stopped writing. And so it was, and it, it, it became a passion to, to write about photography. I covered all kinds of exhibitions, you know, official exhibitions, you know, great exhibitions, student exhibitions, so many exhibitions that it almost seemed like there was photography all over the place. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there was actually less photography than, for example, painting, but you know, I made it, made a presence thanks to El Comercio that it seemed that there was a lot of photography. So in that context, uh, what happened was that Bill Wright, another uh, man from Texas, had come to visit Peru. And he was fascinated with Peru. And uh, he approached, uh, he had the idea of, of doing a photography uh, exhibition uh, about Peru, but uh, a documentary uh, photography exhibition. And because he himself is a great photographer, he does documentary work. He has photographed the Tiwas uh, in indigenous peoples here in Texas. And, uh, and he didn't know who to approach. So he went to Igna and talked to Fernando Torres. I don't know whether he's still around. Yeah. Fernando Torres was a cultural director. And Fernando Torres didn't know uh, who needed to hear this request. And so a group of photographers got together including Pablo's uh, father, uh, Billy Hare, and uh, Roberto Fantosi, and, and I think there was about eight of us. And out of the conversation, everybody began to feel that this could either be very successful or a total disaster, because... Like any exhibition. Right, exactly, <laughs> but, but, but in, in a more dramatic sense, because people wanted to be in the exhibition just be, because they shot, you know, pictures during the weekend, you know. And, uh, and, and so uh, Billy Hare, because I had been writing a lot about photography, uh, suggested, uh, kind of made a motion that I be the curator. And so the other photographers there supported the motion. And so I was elected, you know, by acclamation, curator by acclamation. <laughs> and, and it wasn't going to be an easy job because, you know, I had to say no to a lot of people who expected to be in the show. And that was the most difficult part. And then the other difficult part was that the request from Bill Wright was for museum quality prints. And a lot of people did not know what that meant. And, and uh, it also, because uh, you know Bill was coming from here, did not realize the scarcity of materials that were, um, you know, we had at the time, you know, uh, many photographers had a little batch of paper. Uh, we could get chemicals, but you know, uh, we, we had, they had no selenium, for example. I had two bottles of selenium that I had brought from the US, so I was preciously, they were very precious to me. And so, <clears throat> and then the other problem was that a lot of photojournalists that I picked for the exhibition, 
did not know how to print their own work because this was always done by the magazines. And so we had to print their work. Roberto Fantosi and I printed, I don't know, I think about at least 20% of the prints in, the, in, the, in that exhibition. <clears throat> and so there was that dimension. And the other dimension was the dimension of, of political unrest at the time. And I wanted, in a certain way, to reflect that uh, political unrest. Uh, and it was sometimes very dangerous because you know you were playing with people who had been participants in some kind of conflict, you know, with uh, with terrorism. And uh, so that is you know part of, of of the background of the exhibition. You know, at the end we put together the exhibition, we sent it over to uh, to the U.S. via IGNA, you know, via the diplomatic valise, mm -hmm. and uh, and it arrived for Photo Fest 1990, that, and that was the first venue. Fantastic, and luckily it's still here today. Hmm. There's just some images from the show, some of the ones that are in our show too. Right, and then the other question that you asked that I haven't answered really is, uh, I, I have, you know, documentary photography, I mean, we know what it is, but as, as many things, it's, it's not very uh, easy to come up with a definition. So, and also I wanted to have a little bit more leeway because, for example, I didn't know, certainly Maria, Mariela Goyce's uh, photographs are not strictly sp speaking documentary photography, but in some way they document an aspect of, of Peru that it is, it is you know, of, of the children, for example, being playful, enjoying life in, sp in spite of the destitution. And I thought that was important to show. Mm -hmm. And so I included Mariela Goyce's uh, uh, photographs in, in the exhibition. And also Juan Enrique Bedoya's works, which look at a sort of brighter side during a very difficult time. For real. Um, you briefly mentioned how you became an accidental critic and how that got you the job for, uh, for the Peruvians exhibition. Um, and you published, like you said, reviews all over the place in the Lima Times and, the, and in the Lima Weekly El Comercio. Um, and one could argue that because of your columns and because of the attention that you paid to photography, that um, Lima may not have sort of obtained the kind of vitality of the tradition of photography at the time. Um, Luz Maria says she remembers seeing your columns and believes that they played a really important part um, of like a almost a pedagogical role for the artists that were coming up at the time. Was that part of your intention to sort of help disseminate information and teach people or, I mean, because there was a lot of gaps in like where artists were being trained and what kind of training they could receive and critical training as well. After Sequencia stopped in, in 1980, there was very little kind of activity devoted to that. So did you see your critical practice as part of a pedagogical one as well? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, I wasn't that noble, <laughs> uh, and I was I was kind of inventing myself as a critic as I went along. Uh, you know, in my background related to photography was the fact that I was a photographer, and my dissertation in philosophy uh, dealt with two main topics: uh, one, uh, the issue of the truth of images, which is a very difficult topic in philosophy to address. And the other difficult topic, uh, intentions in photography, which are, very, are uh, philosophically speaking, are a very murky terrain. Uh, logically, they're very difficult to handle. And so that was my background. And, and in doing that dissertation, I visited a lot of the literature about photography that, uh, that later clicked. But uh, I, you know, I wasn't, uh, as I said, I was inventing myself as a critic and basically, I wanted uh, to inform, number one, and in some measure to, to interpret, um, not evaluate. Only once I made a mistake to evaluate, uh, you know, in like uh, Cisco and Ebert, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> Only once I did a thumbs down and I regretted it. And it was difficult to do. I had to, you know, go back to Kant's critique of, uh, of uh, uh, judgment in order to uh, to to uh, to come up with something, you know. Uh, 
but um, but I regretted it because for many reasons. But ever since then, I, I did, haven't done any negative criticism. But I really didn't know what I was doing, to tell you the truth. I mean, people were reading me. Uh, I think basically because as a photographer. I knew what other photographers were doing, and I was just trying to convey that information. I thought of, of critical writing, like uh, like one, one, one French guy in, in, in Peru, typical uh, French question, he asked me once, you know, so what method of uh, criticism do you use? And, you know, I felt like I was naked. You know, I, I, I didn't know. And, uh, and so I said, uh, well, I said, uh, just, the same one that Sherlock Holmes uses <laughs> for uncovering a mystery. Just basically <laughs> reasoning. You know, I tried my, to put myself in the place of the creator, mm -hmm. the perpetrator of the crime, and uh, the context where the crime was committed, you know, the weapons used, you know, the motive of the crime and all that. And basically, that, that, that is what I was uh, doing. Well, th these next few slides of uh, Chambi's self-portrait are a little bit of like you being Sherlock Holmes. Do you want to talk a little bit about, about the, this is part of your scholarly work because not only did you do criticism but you also did scholarly research on Chambi. Right, well I came back, uh, you know, in Sequencia, one of the great exhibitions ever, uh, in turn actually the history of photography in Peru, was the one that uh, Fernando La Rosa did with Martin Chambi, you know, when uh, his work was sort of rediscovered. And so that happened around 19, 1977, I believe I returned to Peru 10 years later. And so I thought that in 10 years, people would have found out a lot of stuff about Chambi, you know, 10 years. And when I, and I returned, I was very curious. And so my friends began to give me all these clippings of things that had been written. And I began systematically, now that I had a commercial working for me, systematically I reviewed every single one of them. And so people kept saying about this and that about Chambi, and, and I wanted to see the proof. Well, Jorge Deusto, who is also a photographer, said to me, you know, if you look at that portrait by Martin Chambi, you know, the negative, the glass negative plate that he's holding is actually uh, another uh, self-portrait by himself years before, when he first arrived in Cusco. And so he told me that because he saw it, but I wanted to see it in order, you know, like uh, St. Thomas to Aquinas, right, to see, see in order to believe. And so I did the experiment. So I, I, I flipped, uh, I, I made a close-up of the negative, uh, I did the positive of the negative, and, and then I traced, I found the uh, self-portrait that was in the negative some years before. And so when this book was published, I, I asked uh, Carlos Montenegro to, to do that in the cover. And, you know, they loved it, of course, mm -hmm. but uh, anyway. So that that was that was the idea, and and then from that, and thanks to Lima Times, you know, they allowed me because El Comercio hardly paid me anything, but uh, but Lima Times, you know, they would give me uh, traveling money, they would give me hotel uh, reservations, they would give me money to go and, and do all this uh, research around Peru, and when they published me, they you know they gave me like two, three, four pages, you know, and so I was. I became, after Chambi, I became very curious about really what I had not found out about Chambi, whether I could find out something myself. And so, that's <coughs> it. oh, and thanks, and I did this also thanks to the fact that, uh, to a, an organization that I belong at the Universidad de Lima called uh, uh, Instituto de Estudios Filosóficos. So it was for philosophical studies. And there, I, again, I, I convinced them that what I was doing in, 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 uh, in this research was, was consistent with my philosophical research. And they bought it. It wasn't. Nice research. job. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. So this is a review that you did of, I think, Luz Maria's very first exhibition. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. So is it true? Was it, did he give you a positive uh, review? Uh, I think it was a positive review, yes. We, it, it was a, a group show of the students of these very small workshops in, that I, we ended in 1989. I was like 19 years old. I met Fernando on those classes because he was friends with a teacher, Carlos Montenegro. And at the end, Carlos Montenegro, the teacher, offered us 
you know, we had done only like these very basic workshops, like to learn how to use a camera and to develop the photos. And he offered us to make an exhibition in a library, in a bookstore, called El Portal, which was uh, located in Barranco, two blocks away from the school. And we did it, and, and Fernando came, and you wrote this, this uh, critic. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history. Yeah.